Hello, sir. Hello, how are you now? Pretty good, Hello. pretty good. How are I you? I want to say one, one a correction. I, I, I adjunct in African studies about two years ago. I haven't been there in about, about, about three years. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> about, about three years ago, when my first book came out. I appreciate that, that correction. So, um, you, uh, could you talk a little bit about your latest project? Yes, uh, this project began about uh, 2010 when I was uh, contacted by someone with the uh, Bicentennial Celebration. It was discovered that there was no comprehensive history of African Americans in Indianapolis. So uh, they were, they asked me if I knew of any, uh, any uh, publications or magazine articles or anything dealing with African Americans in Indianapolis. And I told them no. So I sat down with the late, uh, great uh, Wilma Gibbs uh, and she was able to uh, encourage me to do research and maybe try to pull some inf pull information together. So when the we did arrive to 2020, uh, that we would have at least you know, a, uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, book about African American history. We had topical books uh, in, in, uh, about, but nothing comprehensive. So that was the uh, the genesis of this whole project. Wow. And uh, so you've written uh, two books, one being Indianapolis Jazz, The Masters, Legends, and Legacy of Indiana Avenue. This book really helped me in my research in graduate school. Um, I don't know if you remember me emailing you a few times. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> you a yes, few I do. questions. Uh, so you were a guest in 2014 on the Amos Brown Show when you published your first Indiana Avenue Entertainment book. Um, could you talk a little bit about being on that show and what it was like to publish um, Indianapolis Jazz? Well, it was just, just a, a delight and honor for me to be on the show, the host of the, the late, great uh, Amos Brown. You know, he was very, very encouraging. And he, uh, I was invited back to uh, his uh, uh, program, but then I think I had, there was some technical difficulties with the station that, that day in my entire interview was uh what uh, did not uh was the audio they had an audio problem but i was on there twice with angus brown it was a very very nice uh interview i was i was on there with uh with uh mr uh mr tom ridley who actually is the dean of indiana avenue uh history and culture he has forgotten i mean i he has forgotten more than i know and I, he's my historical guru and i i owe a lot of uh, i'm indebted to him greatly yes yes ridley and amos brown they're just definitely big legends here in the city um so how successful was your first book and is the book indianapolis rhythm and blues the sequel to the first book? i'm sorry how um Sorry about that. Let me, uh, let me just put this person on mute. I don't think I can. Okay. That's all right. So how successful was your first book? And is this book, Indianapolis Rhythm and Blues, a sequel to your first book? Uh, yes. The, the first book was, was surprisingly uh, successful and that I received uh, Facebook posts from around the world. And I was able to realize that our jazz is uh, more ch cherished more in, in Asia and Australia and in some portions of Africa than right here in the United States. And uh, it's the, the book is, uh, has, has sold around the world. And I was able to check with the Central Library, the Pike Branch, and to find out it's even, it's in every, uh, library here in the United States, many of the HBCU libraries, I think all of the HBCU libraries, and uh, even as far as uh, Bangladesh or uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a Arab-speaking country, no, Bangladesh is not Arab-speaking, but uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur of Malaysia, there's a copy of my book on the shelf of, of the, uh, the University of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and I don't know how it got there, but I'm, I'm, but I'm happy that it's, it's being sold around the world. And my second book, was it was like, it was a, a sequel to my, my, my first book. I wanted to, other people wanted, they said, why would you just only talk about jazz? Why don't you talk about rhythm and blues? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So what does that feel like to have your 
book in uh, all over the world in libraries all across America. What is that? What is that? Oh, it's great. Like? You know, it's great, but it's great. It's not. It's not really. Uh, I, it's not all about me. It's it's about my preparation. You know that I was um, I was blessed to be have a graduate of Christian Addicts High School. That we had the 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 the, the, the greatest uh, professors there to teach us and. I just think about all my, my English teachers from uh, uh, Addicts High School and School 17, Miss, Miss Theodosia Lewis, who really grabbed me uh, by the arm and got me on the, the right trail. And Dr. Gaither at Addicts High School, uh, 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 just a, uh, 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 there was a great number of, of English teachers there who, who really helped me along. Miss uh, uh, Miss Bradford. Uh, uh, Augusta Merriweather, Blanche Ferguson. We had a, you know, we were high school students being taught by university professors. We were blessed. Wow. Yeah. It, it, that was just such uh, an amazing school. And I remember seeing the documentary that WFYI put together about its history, which was, is quite, quite amazing. And it makes sense why, you know, the alumni base of Crispus Addicts is so you know, still so involved in wow. Crispus Attics High School. <laughs> um, so how did Crispus Attics High School prepare you to write such such um, great books? Um, what were the qualities of the educators um, and how did they influence you? No, they, they were very, very, uh, uh, they were a, a very encouraging, but firm. And they, I was a class clown and I admit that and I remember school 17, Miss Theodosia Lewis uh, at, at, break, at lunchtime, I, we would go out and play in the uh, eat and then we'd play, but she pulled me back and, and sat down with me for the entire lunch period for a whole week and a half to make sure that I was able to learn her English. And she was very, very thorough. So I always you know, give homage to her because she was a, a great educator, Theodosia Lewis. Mm -hmm. She had two children, uh, Willie Lewis and, and Medora. And uh, 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 at Addicts High School, the English department there, they were great. And I'm, I was just so happy to have those professors that, uh, also that I just mentioned. Mm. What was um, the racial climate in Indianapolis during the early 50s in reference to rhythm and blues played on the local radio stations? Well, during that, that time period, uh, many of the local stations did not play our music. They called our music devil music. So what we would have to do would be stay awake to about 12 o'clock at night and get on our car radios and we listen to Randy's record shop in Gallatin, Tennessee, the, the my old home, my, uh, uh, homestead in Gallatin, Tennessee, and listen to our, our music because the local stations did not want to offend, you know, their sponsors by playing what they considered as a uh, devil music. Mm. Can you um, define what they would, uh, the terms race music? I'm sorry? Can you define the term race music for? Some well, any, any music that dealt with the, the culture of African Americans anywhere, you know, in, in the country around the world was called race music. And I, and I was even collected uh, 78s from around the world for the past 20 years. And some of the, uh, the, the, the dust jackets would have on them, they would send me the dust jacket, they would say, do not play race music. They would be from these radio stations, uh, you know, and I, I have it in my uh, Indian Avenue uh, collection. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Um, if you have any questions for David Williams, please type them in the chat and we will get to them as well. Um, who are some of the early national and local rhythm and blues performers who graced Indiana Avenue stage? Oh, there, there were the Counts, uh, there Jimmy Guilford, uh, 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 Dickie Pearson, his group from Addicts High School, Thurston Harris, who had a record called Little Bitty Pretty One that the, the Jackson Five uh, uh, recorded back in the 1970s. But yeah, there, were, there were a bunch of people here. Uh, Deborah uh, Nelson, uh, 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 we have a list of great ones. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to do was be able to talk about the early history of uh, Indian Avenue, if I might. Oh, yeah, please do. Okay, you know, well, I, I began my history in Vincent, Indiana, with the, uh, the, the there was a pro, there were two cases of uh, Potty Strong and Mary Bateman Clark uh, and the whole issue of indentured servitude. And from there, I moved to uh, the, the founding of uh, Indian Avenue 
what uh, that area in 1820, uh, when there was a, a gigantic catastrophic flood that flooded the entire area, and many of the uh, German and Irish settlers who lived on the banks of White River over near uh, uh, Wishard Hospital, well, now the uh, Wishard Hospital or General Hospital, or, uh, uh, they moved and recently arrived African American uh, escaped slaves settled there. And in 1824, there was a uh, group of uh, roving uh, power workers. Uh, they were contracted by the, the uh, US, I guess, Department of Highways, if there was a term during that time period. It was called Dave Burkhart. And he and his men, they were what they what the early papers considered scalawags or uh, ruffians who lived on, on the uh, on the banks of the Indian Avenue. And their 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 most precious uh, pastime was to to uh, attack African Americans who lived on the, the banks, you know, steal their uh, the, the vegetables from the gardens, their chickens and hogs and uh, they were they were they were terrible. They they were really they're very very racist. But they were called David Burkhart. But his but he came to a, an abrupt end when he went to a a religious revival at Military Park and he was acting up. And the uh, Reverend James Haven, a, uh, a Methodist minister, left the uh, stage and went there to approach him. And Burkhart was still mopping out in Little Havens. Who uh, he reminds me of the uh, the uh, uh, in 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 uh, uh, the movie of I mean, the TV series Mash, the Father Mulcahy. He took his uh, smock off and he beat. I can't use the words here on this um, this this, this uh, but he beat uh, him without mercy. Let me leave it at that. I don't want to, want to be profane, but there's some words I can add there. But anyway, that was the first uh, uh, sign. And then I know later on. There was the John Tucker incident of 1845, uh, when uh, he was doing July the 4th of all days, he's walking down downtown and he was set upon by a bunch of uh, drunken revelers and uh, they, 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 they literally kicked his brains out. And the uh, uh, pastor, uh, uh, the minister right there at the church on the uh, circle, and his, he was the brother of Harriet Beecher Stahl, who wrote, you know, the famous writer who wrote Uncle Tom's uh, Cabin. And he was able to come there and he was able to uh, break up the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the beating, but it was too late. You know, he was, he was there, there, laying there on, on the uh, sidewalk mm. there over the Meridian Street. And I think there's a, a marker there that, that talks about that. But it, but it, it was the, uh, 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 the the brother of uh, Henry Be uh, Henry Beecher style with the stole was able to break break up the fight, but it was too late. And then we uh, we talk about the uh, uh, John Freeman who came to Indianapolis, uh, and he stayed here years and years. And he was mistaken by a former slave owner from uh, Missouri, well Kentucky, but who had moved to Missouri, and he tried to to uh, arrest and take uh, John Freeman, uh, return him to slavery, but he had never been a slave. And so that was a big, a big sensational uh, controversy during this time period that you, that you won't find in the uh, textbooks here in, in the Indianapolis, you know, IPS or any of the schools or the, the library. I had to really search and I was able to read every uh, publication uh, dealing with African-American liter uh, uh, news and, and events from about 1880 to 1980. So I, I was able to, and even some German publications that dealt with African-American history, I was able to have a translator to help me with, with, with those publications as well. Yeah. That was, it was a very, very bad time you know, during the, in the early 1830s and 40s for African-Americans in, uh, in that was, but, look, but luckily we were able to have the Bethel AME Church that was established. And that was like a, a way station for African-Americans uh, during this time period. We were able to go there for, for you know, help the recently arrived uh, African-Americans from the South, primarily Mississippi, Kentucky, and, and t uh, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky were, were able to go to Bethel AME for, for help you know, with food and lodging and what have you. As a matter of fact, it was the Underground Railroad uh, station there. Yes, yeah. Um, and if you um, 
don't know where Bethel is. It is located really close to the canal on West Street, and they're currently converting Bethel Amy Church into a, a hotel. Yes. Uh, yes. So the structure is still there, and it's kind of hidden now um, um, from West Street. You can't, it's really hard to see yeah. now because of the hotel that's surrounding it. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that change and how you feel about it? Yeah, I'm, I, I attended uh, Bethel AME for a number of years, and it really broke my heart when the, the, the last citadel of uh, African-American history, well, one of the last was just, uh, just evaporated, just uh, was evaporated right in front, of, in, front, in front of our eyes. Like we had the Lockfield Garden, the Sunset, uh, all the, the, at the, uh, the, Ave the, the great jazz spots on the Avenue, George's Bar, the PNP Club, the Four Party Club, uh, Al's British Lounge, they were all, uh, 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 they were all destroyed. And now we have Bethel Amy Church and now the, the Walker Theater is, uh, you know, they, they want to do a lot of uh, reconstruction around there. That, you know, and, and people don't realize the Walker Theater, that's our Mecca. And when you come there to try to alter the, uh, the, the architectural splendor of the Walker Theater, Madam C.J. Walker, you, you are trying to, to, re, to re, rebuild the, uh, our, our Mecca. And it, it hurts me to my heart even now. No, I'm, I'm very, 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 uh, I'm very upset over that. And I hope that we can hold on to that architectural integrity up in Dan Avenue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but I wanted to talk about the earlier John Tucker and uh, John Freeman. I was able to luckily uh, get be in contact with a, a, a great uh, illustrator here, uh, 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 Shana uh, Jennings, who was able to do a lot of my uh, illustrations. So what, what she has done, she, has been, she, will, she was able to bring to light a lot of the earlier chapters you know, with her, her, her great illustration. So I really am uh, proud to, to, to be associated with her, to be working with her. And when you see the book, you're going to see some outstanding illustrations from, from Shana Jennings. Outstanding. I'm really happy. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's wonderful. Can y'all, uh, Shana, you're on the call. Can you talk about what it was like to work on this book? Yeah, uh, it was exciting for me because, um, me, myself, I have absorbed myself into um, researching Indiana history in itself and then Indiana Black history, African-American history. So it was a passion of mine as well. And to be able to come together with David and illustrate this, it's... Um, I'm real excited about it because I feel like everyone needs to know the hidden history, the truth. And if I can have a part in that, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really rewarding, uh, really uh, inspiring and it's very educational. And I, I, and I, I'm really excited about the book as, and, and I'm honored to be, a part of this project. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's really great. So, how did you get into art yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, my mother says she always knew I was going to be an artist. Uh, I've won several awards. I got my degree at IU, uh, Indiana University, Indianapolis, Indiana, IUPUI. Heron School of Art graduate. And um, I had a natural God-given talent to become an artist, but it was prevalent very early in my life. <laughs> my mother said that, you know, I had sibling, my brother, he's no longer living, he's deceased. But when we were at that age of, uh, I guess you can say five, six, I took coloring real seriously. And they had the Crayola box, the crayons that had the, the sharpener. Mm -hmm. I had to have a perfect uh, point on my crayons. And if my brother colored in my book, she said that I would destroy the whole book and said it was ruined because I had, you know, I didn't want, I, I was real passionate about coloring. I didn't want by touching my crayons and you know, I share any other toy. I wasn't a selfish kid or anything, but when it came to my 
art, art, you know, my coloring book at that stage in life was my, uh, my outlet for creativity. And, and um, my mother helped put me to school. I got a scholarship because I had excelled. I had excellent grades and I got a scholarship to finish my last year. And I'm really uh, blessed and thankful. And this is a way for me to give back of doing this project to the community mm-hmm. and really make my artwork uh, have meaning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a purpose, a meaning and a purpose, you know. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much. Um, okay, St- yeah, Stephen, you had mentioned about uh, uh, Bethel AME Church. I wanted to bring you up to the 1850s. Uh, I was able to, doing my research at IUPUI and in, in, in the Historical Society, I was able to find a uh, uh, an Indianapolis uh, history, uh, history Bureau. There was research done by uh, the late great uh, classmate of mine, Gwen Crenshaw, and no one really knew much about the ant- the uh, colonial colonialist American Colonial Association meetings of the 1850s at Bethel A.M. Church. I-, I searched all the literature I couldn't find, but I was able to go and find out that in the early 1850s there was a movement. By uh, that had had spawned, spawned decades earlier, where they wanted to put us on ships in Indianapolis and send us to Monrovia, Liberia, mm. and there was a uh, minister uh, by the name of uh, Benjamin Taylor Cavanaugh who came up here from uh, from uh, Alabama, Georgia, someplace down south, and he was able to meet with the the uh, uh, Reverend uh, Willis Rebels at Bethel A.M. Church, and he got in the pulpit, and he says, in order to to uh, fight the racism here in Indianapolis, maybe you uh, you well to, well to do African Americans can come with us to Charleston, South Carolina, get on a ship, and go to uh, Monrovia, Liberia. And and I have a list of uh, all the families who left here from 1846 until the the beginning of the. Uh, Civil War, who jumped on those ships and went to Monrovia, Liberia. Many of them died on the, on the ships going over there, and many died after they got there because there was a, a similar type of a, uh, a African flu there that uh, was killing people just like the, the flu that we, we experience today. So that was a very interesting research. I had no idea, but I spent a whole entire chapter dealing with the, this, uh, uh, the chapter is called Negroes, Y'all Go Back to Africa. Uh, where where I talk about all the the the, the players the uh, who were in that movement to send us not back to Africa. Many of the people that had they were they had been living in America for for several generations, but they wanted to send us to uh, wanted to send us to Africa and not back to Africa. So that's a very mm-hmm. interesting chapter uh, that I uh, spent a lot of time on. Wow, I've never heard that uh, piece of our history before. So that's that will be a very interesting read. Um, can you tell us how many families, it, approximately how many families went on, went back, went to Liberia? Well, as a matter of fact, I have the the list right here now that that's in the book. I know I don't, we're not able to see it on the, I wasn't able to download it, but I have a list of the families from all these little. Indianapolis and satellite towns around who got on the, the ship to go to uh, Monrovia, Liberia. And some of them may have uh, family members living here in Indiana who may have lost contact and, and who may have family members living in Liberia. Mm. And I mean, I have names of them you know, uh, that you'll see in the book. And But I wouldn't want to read it now because of our time constraints. But that was a very interesting uh, 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 fact that uh, I didn't find in any of the uh, textbooks. And then er- and later on, in the 1890s, there was a very famous, there was a famous music teacher. His name was Henry Hart. He uh, taught music uh, here in Indianapolis, and he was able to perform for President uh, Benjamin Harrison and several of the, of the governors. He had uh, two daughters, uh, Hazel Hart and Myrtle Hart, who were outstanding music students. And Hazel Hart, uh, uh, began to work for IPS in the early 1900s, and unfortunately, unfortunately, she was killed in an automobile accident in 1930. And the school 37 on the east side on 25th Street is named the Hazel Hart Hendry School 37 in her honor. Mm. And I wasn't able to find out anything on that. It, it's not in the uh, in, in our textbooks. Mm. And I was, you know, so I wanted to 
you know, to really uh, uh, celebrate much of the hidden history here in Africa, America, Indianapolis, so future generations can see and learn, you know, of all colors, not only African American, but all, all colors can learn of the rich legacy that we have here in Indianapolis that we should all be, be proud of. Absolutely. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I started this lecture series is because I don't remember learning a lot about Indianapolis history in school. Um, and so, you know, this lecture series is here to kind of highlight how rich our history really is so we can have that sense of identity and, and sense of place right here in our, our very own city. So thank right. you for saying that, making that oh, point. Oh. And then and two other things too that, that I was able to uh, focus on was the fact that we all know of the uh, uh, Flanner House, but people don't, don't realize that Francis Frank Flanner came to Indianapolis in 1898 and he, he, he founded the Flanner House for recently migrated slaves from uh, the Southern states. And with his own money going to his own pocket, he was able to establish a uh, the first planter house, which ironically was right across the street from where I was born in Lockville Gardens, right on Rhode Island Avenue or Colton Street and Blake Street. And he's able to have a social service agency for you know, medical uh, issues, employment, uh, health, uh, 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 job training, everything. And we really own a, a great debt to uh, the Flanner, Flanner and the Buchanan people because at a time period when people other people didn't want us to come to Indianapolis. They were they were going in, into their pockets and putting money out to help us make the transition from the you know, the agrarian, racist atmosphere of the uh, South to the metropolitan <laughs> racist uh, atmosphere of Indianapolis, Indiana. The, 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 so when you think about Planner House, you think about the, the family who didn't have to do it, but they did. Mm. And, and I'm very proud. And I'm, I'm in contact with Bruce Buchanan, who. Uh, has helped me financially with this project. Uh, yeah, I, I really am you know, ha happy to, to be working along with him also. Wonderful. We have uh, a question here from the, in the chat from Lauren uh, Patton. Uh, what advice do you have for researchers of black history in Indiana? Uh, to tell the truth, and you don't have to be hyperbolic, just tell the truth, you know, do the research, uh, get the facts and present the facts to the public. And we have a lot of uh, resources here. Uh, we, we have the Indiana Historical Society, the Indiana State Library, the Chris Attics uh, High School uh, uh, Alumni Museum, uh, Butler, Uni uh, the Butler University, then there, I mean, then there are people who are, who are here now who still, who still would have that, that information to impart. And one person I would, would, would miss would, would be uh, uh, Mr. Thomas Ridley, who uh, is the, as I said, he's the Dean of Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana Avenue history. He very, very, very well versed, very well versed. He's 97 years old and he gets around like he's 55 years old. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> Uh, we have another question here in the chat. What is the most interesting thing you have discovered about African Americans in Indianapolis so far? I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to get to the next point. <laughs> and, and, uh, I was able to run across a book called The Saga of Coleridge. It was written in, in eight, 1994 by Wim Montel of the University of Kentucky. And I, you know, I was able to research the, the uh, a sensational murder occurred in 1906 on 24th Street. And I was able to find out that there was a, a, a young man who came from a part of uh, 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 Southern Kentucky called Coleridge. His name was Jesse Cole. And he was, uh, he came from a community where, you know, they were the law. He came here in 1906 with his buddy, George Williams. And on October of 1906, there was a, there was a uh, call made to the uh, uh, Indianapolis Police Department that there were two drunken coloreds fighting on 24th Street. So when the uh, policemen arrived there, they found out that, that there was no two colored drunkards uh, there, but, but they saw these two young men across from this house kind of peering in the house 
And so they went there and they went to, to uh, inspect and they asked the gentleman, they said, can you uh, walk toward us? And, and then they asked one gentleman, can you take your, your hand out of your, your jacket? And he, he did. He took his hand out, Jesse took his hand out and he shot the police officer in the heart and the police officer staggered back and he fell, uh, fell against the fence and died. His buddy, his name was Charles J. Murphy. His, his buddy, uh, Edward J. Petticourt, took off after uh, Jesse Cole. And he was shot in the back by, uh, by George Williams, uh, Jesse's uh, buddy. Jesse went to his sister's house on the Fall Creek. He hid under a, a, a board in the kitchen. The next day he went to, uh, he dressed up as an old woman and he walked down to the Union Station and, and caught a train back to Tompkinsville, uh, Kentucky. And he stayed there for uh, about, about a year or so. To make a long story short, he was, uh, 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 his uh, uh, cousin, distant cousin, turned him in to the authority and he was uh, shot and killed. Uh, they took his body on the uh, train back to Indianapolis. He was uh, embalmed at the uh, Cassius Marcellus Clay Willis funeral home in uh, 1908 uh, in, uh, on Indian Avenue. So the Willis uh, funeral home was known as Cassius Marcellus. That was his name. So he was Cassius Marcellus Clay in the 1880s. <laughs> and anyway, uh, after they embalmed him, the police department asked them, could they please bring the body to the police station? And they, they took the body to the police station and they propped the body up on a wall they exposed the, his shirt to see where the bullets uh, had entered his body. And they, they, it was like a carnival-like atmosphere of people walking past there, seeing the body of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Jesse Cole in front of the police station. But what, what was the, the kicker was that I, I wanted to do other research to find out, could I get photographs of that for the book? I called Central Library and there was a gentleman there who had done research for the uh, uh, Department of Correction. And he gave me, he said, well, let me give you my research and I, you know, I will, maybe that'll help you. So I, I took his folder. I took it home, had it on my computer. That's for about three or four days. And late one night, I got up to look at the uh, folder and I was able to see the picture of the uh, 1906 edition of the NF Star. And, and it said, this is where the murder occurred. Now, I looked closely, I realized, I mean, to, to my surprise, I think I hollered, that uh, that was my house. They were trying to break in my house in 1906. And the, the uh, fence that, that Charles J. Murphy died upon, that was the fence in my backyard that I lived in in, in the, 19, the late 1960s. So that was, that was shocking to me to find out. That I'm doing the research 60 or 70 years uh, later and to find out that the this whole this, this incident uh, occurred in my house or around my house and it had to do with my house. And I, I mean, that really, I'm still kind of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. That is incredible <laughs> yeah I, I, your research you were actually able to make a personal connection yeah too. i made a personal uh, connection and then yeah, later on i talk about addicts high school and how you know the uh dc stevenson uh, the kuthas clan came to town and before that time blacks and whites would go would attend school together but when he came to town with, with this clan uh, uh a clown wagon they you know they uh constructed uh uh, Addicts High School and the, the races were separated and how important that is to the our community today. And I, I want a lot of the, 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 the Generation Xers and the Zs to know that that event and then the 1955 Addicts Basketball Championship is so vital because a lot of the younger, our younger people have no idea about what the, the trials and tribulations that their uh, parents and grandparents and great grandparents experienced during this time period. And, I, I talk about the Addicts basketball team in, in 55 with Oscar Robinson, William Merriweather, and how that that uh, that history should be uh, preserved. And I was able to, luckily about two years ago, come in contact with a, a young lady from Zionsville, Indiana, uh, Laura Williams Town, who had 
written a, a, a brilliant play about the 1955 uh, Addicts basketball team. Uh, 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 one of the players, uh, Bill Hampton and me, uh, went to the Pacer, uh, uh, the, the, I think the Bankers, how, Bankers, whatever, Bankers, I can't think of the name, uh, where, where the Pacers play, and we were able to hear a reading of it, and it's fantastic. So I'm hoping that we can get behind this play so the younger generations can see it and actually play it really, it really depicts and illustrates that whole era, that whole time period when addicts players could not play on certain, in certain gymnasiums. They were not, after the games, they, they were not able to uh, uh, be uh, received at the restaurants. And I think this younger generation should know about this. And thanks to the play of, of Laura Williams Town, that uh, this can be brought to light. And, and so I'm very happy about that, extremely happy. Mm, yeah. Um, I want to bring us up to the 1970s uh, when UNIGOV went into effect. So we're on like the 50th anniversary of when UNIGOV went into effect. Can you talk about uh, UNIGOV and how that affected the African-American community? Yes, I can. I have entire, it's interesting that you mentioned that I have an entire uh, chapter where I deal with UNIGOV and how it really, the chapter, I, I explained that during this time period, uh, there was a uh, just like it is now. There was a uh, a a a, a move a, a, a I guess a movement or a moment, and not exactly a movement, but maybe a movement to, to some degree, where there were African American mayors who were being uh, elected. Like we had uh, Richard Hatcher in Gary, Indiana. Uh, then there was a, a Carl Stokes in uh, Cleveland. So. The uh, politicians here said, "Wait a minute! You know, with this large African American voting uh, population, we have to we 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 should do something to dilute the African American vote." So I think it's Richard Luger who engineered this program of uh, Unigo, where they were able to dilute the African American vote so properly. You know, there there there's been years that uh, that we would uh, it would be years before we'd have an African American mayor because the our our inner our uh, inner uh, or inner city vote had been diluted. And a lot of the uh, the great legal people like uh, attorney uh, uh, Ransom, they, they fought, you know, they fought vigorously against this whole concept, but it was to no avail. So that's why we have Unigov today. But read my chapter on Unigov and uh, it'll really bring to light a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, nefarious uh, undercurrent in the political system that going on at that time period, how they were able to convince some people in our community. I don't mention those people. I don't want to start in trouble, but who went along with this, this whole Unigov uh, uh, project and diluted our vote. And it seems like that um, the percentage of the African-American population in Indianapolis is approaching 30%. Um, so it seems like those kind of conversations uh, about getting electing a black uh, mayor are starting to happen again, um, especially with the last election cycle where it was put out um, a plan, uh, a mayor, uh, a plan for mayors to adopt um, for servicing um, the black uh, black community. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think that is an interesting point to make. Um, and that in those 50 years between Unigo passing in 1970 and now we still have not had a black mayor in our city. Uh, uh, sadly, but, but no, but only due to Unigo. Until we straighten that out, you know, and also straighten out this whole issue of Indian Avenue and, and the Walker, you know, we will, we will, we will just, we will still be at a, at a, at a, a terrible disadvantage politically, politically. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the project happening around the Walker Center and how history kind of comes into play in fighting for the Walker in that space along Indiana Avenue um, currently? Yes, I think there's a, 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 a movement called Reclaim Indiana Avenue and they're working very hard to try to uh, uh, have some input into the architectural uh, rendering of this whole project. And I think that maybe a few weeks ago, the this company uh, decided not to be involved in this project. So I don't know where it is now. There are the people, you know, they're probably on the, you know, listening audience who uh, would, would, would be be, uh, be better informed. Mm 
uh, than me. But I, I do know that there are a lot of people, including myself, I was born and raised in Lockfield Gardens. Indian Avenue was my mecca. You know, it was it was my life. You, know, you could go there. You know, went to School 24, 17, Mary Cable School 4, Addix High School, and that's that's that's. I mean, that was our, our mecca. And to see our mecca be pushed into the Nile River, you know, it's very it's very very hurtful to me. Very hurtful. Absolutely, absolutely. With that said, can you talk about why it's important for African Americans to research, document, record, and write history? Why it's important for like his, for people in history to research? Why why it's important for African Americans to research, document, and record our history? Well, well it's very very important because uh, the other here in Indianapolis uh, when I when I was uh, involved with the. Uh, I got information from the Bicentennial Commission. I was able to, the, the panel, there were, there were uh, uh, comprehensive histories from different you know, religious, uh, uh, ethnic communities in Indianapolis, but there was nothing, you know, there was nothing really uh, written about a, a comprehensive history of African-American history. So uh, it's very, very important for us. Let's try to you know, increase the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the number of books Written about African American history. I mean, there, you know, there's there's a, a Italian history, a, a Greek history, Polish history, a Catholic history, which is which is fine. I mean, I have nothing against it. That's great. I mean, they these communities they want to to really uh, 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 magnify the, the the greatness you know of their culture, and I, I have nothing against it. But I'm saying, what? Why not African American history? And I've spoken to some of the uh, people. They would say, well. It's very, very painful. Well, it's painful, but there are other histories that have been very, very painful. The, the, there's a history of the, the Jewish community, which is very, very, uh, you know, I've read a very uh, 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 much about the Jewish the, the Holocaust. My uncle helped uh, uh, liberate the, uh, some of the concentration camps in Germany. And he's very, he was very, uh, very proud about that, but we could never talk to him about that. We were told, do not talk to Uncle Aaron about the, uh, his World War II uh, service and and the the Holocaust. He does not want to talk about that. So you know, we we knew at an early age. Do not talk about that. So, uh, it, so I made it my business to try to learn as much as I can about the uh, the, the Holocaust and Jewish history. And it's a very very rich history. I have a very good relationship with the Jewish community. And and uh, and and, and uh, but uh, we has we we should overlook the pain. And write about the history because it's uh, it should be passed down to the the generation X's and the generation Z's and the generations to come. That we have a very rich history that we should be proud of. And we have so much of which to be proud. And let's write, let's research, and let's document. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. I want to also thank everyone for coming today. Um, are there any questions from any of the participants on the call today? Are there any questions there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here to. Are there any questions that you, you would have? Up? And, uh, put it in the chat or you can unmute. All right, we have one from Teresa Browning. Did you address the segregation of IPS schools in 1970s that literally became a federal case with Judge Dillon, Dillian making a decision to move desegregation forward? It seemed to affect African Americans greatly. Yes, I can discuss that, you know, on the. Uh, uh, Oh, Ted Green's brilliant documentary, uh, Addicts, the School that Opened the City. You know, uh, uh, I talk about that, and I have a, a personal connection with that because Mr. Andrew Ramsey, my high school Spanish uh, professor, led, he was one of the catalysts behind that movement. He wanted to, uh, he, he fought for the, the desegregation of the Indianapolis public school system for years and years. I remember it as a, one of his Spanish students going with him out to, uh, uh, Plainfield, Indiana, to a, uh, uh, a Stokely Van Camp, a Mexican uh, migrant camp. And we had a program there to tutor, and I spoke Spanish, and to tutor some of the uh, the young children there so they would be able to stay abreast of their, their studies. And then also, I remember going with him to the, uh, at Butler University to uh, demonstrate against uh, the, the governor, I think the Mississippi governor, Ross Barnett. I remember having a, uh, a placards uh, 
uh, demonstrated against him. So Mr. Ramsey, who was my mentor, was a part of that. He was able to uh, engineer this whole desegregation uh, project uh, that, that, that went to the federal government, the Department of Education, and we were able to, uh, to they were able to desegregate the schools and have busing during the 1970s. I was out of town through this time period, but I do know uh, Mr. Andrew Ramsey, my Spanish teacher was the, he was the general behind that, that whole movement. We have a statement here from Madison. I strongly agree that we need more African-American history. I think the Indiana Historical Society has been doing a good job of telling some of the stories and especially in collecting the essential documents, thanks to the hard work of Wilma Gibbs. Mm -hmm. Definitely a shout out to Wilma. Yes, Bill, thank you so much for that. We have, a, uh, I wanna give a shout out to her because Wilma Gibbs at a time period when I was getting rejection letters from IU Press about my first book because I, I didn't organize it well. Wilma Gibbs, uh, Dr. Stanley Warren, Dr. David Baker, my uh, classmate from School 24 Kindergarten, Ethel Milligan Middlebrooks, all uh, uh, partnered with me to get these things straightened out. So the Indiana Historical Society really uh, helped me tremendously. And you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the work, the brilliant work of Wilma Gibbs is, is continues uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, the, a lot of the, the researchers there in, in the library who, who, are, who are doing a great, very, a great job. Very, a great job. Absolutely. And uh, we got a question before we run out of time about your book. So we want to know what is the title of your book? Where can we purchase it and when will it be available? Okay, well, first of all, let me say the, the person who's doing a wonderful job there is, is uh, uh, Susan Hall Dodson. And she is now in the, the, art, the, she's the archivist there and she's uh, doing a great job. And I, I really commend her for her help as well. Uh, yeah, this book will be, uh, it'll be published on Indiana University Press. It, it should have been out for Black History Month, but because of the, the uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic that it'll be pushed back to probably June and July of uh, 2021, and it'll be uh, uh, it'll be uh, ready to be uh, it'll be released probably June or July of uh, next year. And it's the uh, uh, African Americans in Indianapolis, 1820 to 1970, uh, the history of a people determined to be free. And uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that people will be as excited about this book as they were about my books on uh, jazz and uh, uh, Indianapolis uh, Rhythm and Blues, because to me it's much more important because it, this will be passed down to our, uh, the, the young people who really have no idea about our rich history. Like I hope, I'm hoping that it'll be in the uh, reading material for the Indianapolis Public Schools, uh, Speedway, yeah, Speedway Public Schools, uh, Pike Township, uh, Washington Township, Wayne Township, all the schools, because uh, there's, you know, we, we have to, in order to, for us to uh, uh, feel positive about ourselves, we have to be nurtured by our history. And if we have no history there, how can we be nurtured? And I remember when I was, I was uh, living with some of the great grandchildren, the Emperor Haile Selassie, in Ethiopia, they asked me about uh, 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 African American history, and I told them that, uh, and they, they, well, they told me there that, that you know, in order, if you have no no history, it's like a, a tree that has poison roots. The, uh, uh, the 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 fruit that it bears will be disfigured, you know. And uh, and I, I I took that to the slave castles uh, about a decade later in uh, Accra, Ghana, Elmina Castle. I came out of a slave castle and I was approached by uh, one of the village elders. He said the same thing. He said, if you really don't appreciate your history, you're like a, you're like a tree with poison roots. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the fruit will be disfigured. And I thought about from Ethiopia all the way over to Ghana, that the same, same message. We have to uh, write our history. We have to pass this information down. Our children who are out there, you know, doing things that, that, that weren't brought over on the ship in 1619, a lot, a lot of the cases, they don't know the history. And it's left up to us to provide them with their history. And it's not a thing of all black or all this, it's for all the, of all colors. I mean, uh, I, I'm not a racist, you know. I want all the children, you know, uh, 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 African-American, European-American, 
Hispanic, uh, 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 of all the faiths, to be able to join us together. And let's, let's celebrate African-American history together as a one America and not a disunited America, but a, a, a one America where all people are, are, are respected and treated treated uh, equally. And I hope that in the, 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 in the next, what, four years to come, that we can somehow approach that. And I don't want to get political about it. So I, 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 anyway, you know where I'm, where I'm going with this. So if there, if there any other, but anyway, I want to just thank a lot of my, 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 my help, uh, 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 Shana Jennings, uh, Ethel, uh, uh, Milligan Middlebrooks, and the, the people from the Indiana Historical Society, yeah, yeah, Susan Hall, uh, uh, Dodson, the late great Wilma Gibbs, who have really helped me. Uh, uh, Suzanne Ahan, who's helped me tremendously in there, and uh, uh, Nadia Kosari. These people, they they've gone above and beyond the, the call of duty to, to make sure that this book is going to be. I hope this will be very very important. Not for me. It's, it's not about me. It's it's about the community, and the the uh, the, the accolades should not go to me or you know, where I'm, I'm uh, going to school, but to my teachers, Christmas Attics High School, you know, my great professors there, you know, who prepared me. And, and I, I owe all my, I'm indebted to them greatly for uh, these three books, because if not for them, I wouldn't be sitting here today in 2020 talking about our history. It's all about Christmas Attics High School and how to preserve Addicts High School, and I'm hoping that our projects, the projects that I mentioned with, with uh, uh, Laura Williams Town and other projects, the Addicts uh, Museum can be preserved and that we will be able to uh, to preserve this history of uh, Indiana Avenue and Chris's Addicts High School and African-American history in general. Mm, exactly, exactly. Very well said. Thank but, you. That, yeah, but there should be, I, I got five more minutes, so please, uh, another question. I yeah. want every second of my time, I want every second. Oh, well, yeah, we're going to so get somebody, it. Somebody give me, give me a question. Give me a question. Is there any question out there? Or if I can make a comment. Uh, I think I've covered all the points that I, I, I wanted to cover. Well, there's going to be a great section on the, uh, the heroes and sheroes of, of Addicts High School. The military people, you know, the, the uh, 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 Tuskegee Airmen, the uh, Golden 13, all of our teachers there. And then one of the persons in particular, uh, there's a lady who's alive, you know, Alberta Stanley White. She was on the X documentary. She, she uh, celebrated her 103rd uh, uh, birthday a, a, a few months ago. I was able to go over there and give her a birthday card. And uh, she's still here with us. She was a wag during World War II. And she was, she's one of the, the uh, military people that I hold up, who I'm very, very proud of. Yeah, she's a relative of the, the, the great uh, Bridgeforth family here in Indianapolis. And uh, she's in the book, the photographs of Graham Martin, the generals, Overton, uh, uh, Harry Brooks, uh, 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 Harry Brooks, uh, Gra Graham Martin, uh, Charles Hall, all those people in the Action Museum will be highlighted and uh, celebrated in this book as well. So please, for the, not for me, but for these generations, if you have uh, like uh, community centers, uh, churches, anywhere where history can be uh, can be read, please have this book there. You know, it's not for me. I'm not making any money out of it. You know, writers don't make money. But I just want to pass this information on to the uh, people who really would be able to uh, to profit by it for, for, for this generation and generations to come. Absolutely. Is there a question out there? I got three minutes. Somebody asked me a question. I know someone has one. Uh oh, is that a question coming? Is there something there? I got two minutes. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> okay. But anyway, but but the All people. Right. Will, They'll be very, very uh, pleased with the with the chapter that I do on Bethel Amy Church because it's very, very in depth. It's very, very detailed about this rich history that, that uh, uh, people don't don't really know about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, examples of Shana's work? Yes, I do. I'm glad you mentioned that. But this is, I'm sorry that, that I wasn't able to download this before. But this is one illustration of Marshall Taylor, the great. Uh, 
Uh, by, by, by yeah, and then beautiful. Yeah, Wham, look at this right here. I say, she, she, Wham D. McCoy. Uh, the he was the uh, the ambassador to Liberia in 1880, who went to Liberia and he died six months later because of the African flu. And my grade school, my grade school, along with Ethel uh, uh, Milligan Middlebrook's grade school, was named the Wham D. McCoy School 24 in 1898. So, Long before we was there. And here, here's a ship that Shana uh, illustrated that took people from, from Indianapolis, Indiana to Charleston, South Carolina to jump on the ship to go to Monrovia, Liberia, because Benjamin Taylor Cavanaugh said that we would be happy, happier in Africa than here in Indianapolis because we would learn languages and we would be able to spread Christianity to the natives and all this type of thing. But we knew that that was a, that we were, we were being bamboozled like Malcolm talked about. We, we were being bamboozled. And uh, so at the last minute we came to our senses and we uh, ran Benjamin Taylor Cavanaugh out of the pulpit back down to Missouri or wherever he is from. Mm. Yeah. David, did you have the one of uh, uh, Polly Strong? Oh yeah, Polly. Yeah, Polly Strong. That's such uh, a strong story. Oh yeah, but I know I wouldn't have time to. Oh my God, yeah. Uh, but so please, yeah, Shana, I feel like Shana. I feel like you should make uh, posters for, especially that one of uh, uh, Major Taylor. I would, I could yeah. put that yeah, on. Well, I will, yeah, I would share them with you. But but if you can <laughs> see the one that she's done, yeah, Polly Strong and. Uh, 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 Mary hey, Bateman so Clark, I mean, they're right. fantastic. I mean, uh, and Mary Bateman Clark, she's from the Eunice Brewer Trotter family up here in Indianapolis. She's Eunice Brewer Trotter's great, great, great uh, relative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll bring uh, these illustrations and hopefully there'll be other universities and historical associations who would like to have her as an illustrator because she is tremendous, tremendous. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes, well, we are, at time, and I want to be respectful of everyone's afternoon. I want to thank our presenter today, David Leander Williams. You are wonderful, and thank you all for spending the afternoon with us uh, at the Central, virtually with uh, the Indianapolis Public Library and David Williams. Have a good afternoon, everybody. You too. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Everybody. Okay. That was great. That was really yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Really good. I love hearing about this project. I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to get my hands on the book. Well, as soon as it comes out, you know, you know, you uh you 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 and Shannon, y'all be the first person to uh I'm gonna run to it. <laughs> yeah, to make sure. Yeah, I definitely need a copy for my collection. That's for yeah, sure. yeah. In the, the